Let's talk about the front office. Well, first of all, who's going to be, and we have them tomorrow, big press conference tomorrow at noon. Who's making decisions? Who's the primary football executive? Who's saying this is the direction that we're going? These are the type of linebackers we're looking for. This, you know, is it going to be Mayo um, when it comes to the number three overall pick? Who's the decider when it comes to are we trading down? Are we taking a quarterback? Are we taking Marvin Harrison Jr.? Like, who is who, who is doing that? He's Greg. I'm Nick. We have so much to talk about. Thanks for joining us as always. Uh, Greg, we'll get to everything on this podcast. But first, I got to tell everyone listening, this episode, of course, brought to you by FanDuel, the exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. Right now, new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets guaranteed when you place a $5 bet. All right, Greg. Let's start with the uh, interview news. There's a lot of stuff, as I said, to sift through. We've got the crafts and, and they're saying personnel. We, we've got a lot of stuff going on. But let's start with some of these interviews. Uh, Gerard Mayo reportedly interviewing Tim Lukabu for the D.C. position. Uh, there was also some reports out there. I think Bert had this first that Brian and Steve Belichick have both been offered gigs and there's been some thought about DeMarcus Covington. So let's start with Luka Boo. What do you think's going on here? Uh, well, it, it, really, I don't know much about him. And we'll see, you know, how serious this is. Um, that, you know, Gerard Mayo gets the head job and this is the first guy he talks to. I mean, certainly significant. Um, you know, I don't know how much of the connection um, is there. You know, could it be Mayo's agent? You know, I... I don't know, but I will say that that he is at least requesting permission to interview for defensive coordinator and special teams coordinator. That means that a those positions are open, which DC we know because they never had one, and that b Gerard Mayo is intent on naming a defensive coordinator. And all this stuff might not seem significant to um, you know people listening at home, but. In terms of the way NFL teams are required to hire and the the the, the procedures they have to go through, um, you know, it's it's significant. And now, I don't know what the status of the Panthers' coaching staff is there. Obviously, they had an interim head coach. Um, they don't have a new head coach. Are you know, is he under contract? Is he free? Are they allowing them to be free to interview with anybody? Uh, but look. The, the the point remains is that when it comes to any coordinator position, it's almost the same under the Rooney rules as the head coach. So uh, they can conduct all the virtual interviews they want after this weekend, say basically a week from yesterday. So January 22nd is when they can start conducting in-person interviews and they have to uh, interview at least two minority candidates for every coordinator position. I think they have to talk to one if they're hiring a quarterback coach, uh, anybody who touches the quarterback. So, um, look, I just think it's interesting that Gerard Mayo, it looks like he's going forward with, I'm going to have a defensive coordinator. Now, there's also the, the the report, like you said, from Albert Breer, that Steve and Brian Belichick were offered uh, positions to stay. Does that mean Steve's not going to be the defense coordinator? Is he going to be the, in the mix? Is Luka Boo just sort of, um, you know, on the list to talk to for the coordinator position, but he really wants to hire Steve? We're going to have to see uh, how all that sort of fold, uh, unfolds. And, of course, if you're if you're Gerard Mayo, you could use these interviews with a Luka Boo to hire him in another position. If 100%. He's not if he's not going to stay in Carolina, we saw Belichick do that with Adrian Clem when he was going through the OC search. So that's also a possibility. What are your thoughts about Demarcus Covington, Greg? We've seen Steve, and and I know people will push back and be like, "Oh, the Belichicks are staying." Look, Steve's been really good. The the Steve Belichick Gerard Mayo combination since 2019, analytically and st- statistically, has been fine. It's been good. It's been top ten. But what do you make of DeMarcus Covington? I know people see him as a possible head coach down the road. Would you like the move if he was the guy that got the promotion? Yes, absolutely. I mean, I, I think the world of DeMarcus Covington in terms of a coach, and you know, and I agree with you as far as Steve goes, 
I mean, look, do I have my issues um, with Steve as a defense coordinator? Do I think they could have been better at times? Yes. But if Steve Belichick was going to be the Patriots defense coordinator, they could certainly do a lot worse. <coughs> Matt Patricia. Um, <laughs> so I, I'm, I, I would be good with that. But DeMarcus, you know, say Steve, it looks like this and, and, you know, Nick, here's sort of the overarching, overlording situation with this whole coaching staff is there are a lot of people, and I would put Steve and Brian Belichick in this boat for sure. They're waiting to see what happens with Bill. Yep. Um, so I think that Gerard is well aware of that. I think that Gerard is very wisely keeping his options open, sort of making preparations. You know, I love your thought about, and it's sort of, what we criticize them for doing for not doing with the head coach position, which is taking the opportunity. Yeah, I mean, nobody's in a rush. There's not a football game until, you know, September uh, of talking to people around the league, getting familiar with people. Um, you never know. You might talk to Luca Boom and be like, you know, hey, hey if Demarcus Covington is really going to be my DC, then Luca Boo would be great on the defensive line or at linebacker or what have you. So. Um, so we criticize them for not doing this with the head coaching search, not looking around the league, mining possibilities as far as, you know, coaches and also attitudes towards analytics and, and free agency and cap management. But it seems like Gerard very wisely is doing that, um, you know, with the coaching staff. So I, there are a lot of people and I would even put, you know, Bill O'Brien in it, which I'm sure we're going to talk about offensive coordinator very shortly. Uh, I think there's a lot of people waiting to see what happens with Bill Belichick, and then they'll sort of go from there. Special teams is also obviously on the docket for Gerard Mayo, and reportedly yesterday he requested an interview with Marquise Williams uh, from Atlanta. You have to imagine, maybe I'm wrong on this, Greg, but no matter what goes on with Bill Belichick, as far as New England goes, you have to imagine that Joe Judge and Cam Acord are gone. Yes, I would uh, imagine that is so. And there's certainly, you know, evidence there to support that as far as DVOA, other analytics. Now, I do think in Rick, Rick Gosselin's special teams rankings, which um, I know the Patriots hold very highly. I think the Patriots finished like 14th in the league, which I assume was a, it was a big improvement over last year. DVOA tells otherwise. They, I think they were next to last. Uh, but yeah, it looks like Gerard, for whatever reason, and look, a lot of these things, or at least some of these changes, Nick, could just be some of the dynamics that went on behind the scenes with this coaching staff that, yeah. you know, the, that Gerard, you know, reports from me, reports from other stuff in the Seth Wickersham story about how, um, you know, how how Mayo was perceived and sort of the backroom drama and all that with the coaching staff. You know, it's quite possible that Mayo has his eyes on some people like, you know, these people would be saying this and these people would be saying that. So I, I don't want them here anymore. All right, let's get to offensive coordinator. Uh, I just finished up a podcast on this Nick Cattle Show pod. If you want to check out my solo venture on YouTube, but let's kind of sift through all the reporting so far, Greg, because there's been a lot. There's reporting that O'Brien could stay. There's reporting that Josh McDaniels could return. Uh, Bert said the other night on uh, Sports Sunday, I think it was Sports Sunday, that this is going to be an open search and that Gerard Mayo has been empowered to find the next guy. Let's start with O'Brien. What are you hearing about Billy OB and the possibility of him staying here in New England? Okay, so um, what I understand about Bill O'Brien is he has two years left on his contract. Um, now, I haven't heard him say this. Again, I just want to make it clear. I haven't spoken to Bill O'Brien since before, I think, before he came back here. Um, he's very much, you know, rank and file, you know, Bill's in charge. Like, I just work here, that sort of thing. So we I, we haven't talked at all. So Anything that I might say probably is going to piss him off, but you know, what have you from what I understand, and this could be not correct, but from what I understand, he has two years left on his deal. I, I, I don't, I think there's some question about how much he wants to remain here. Now, what I do find interesting and look, let's give Kern his flowers. Kern has been um, 
right about all this. Belichick's departure, Mayo being the next guy, and he was very resolute in, in all of that all along um, for whatever reason. He also said for a long time that Bill O'Brien would be the offensive coordinator. Now, I'm not saying that's not going to happen. I still think that's going to happen. I think there are a lot of the assistant coaches have uh, taken a beat. Maybe they told them, you know, take some time, get away from it all, refresh your head, then think about it. I know some of them are on vacation this week. Um, so that could be a play. But, you know, do I think there's some question about how much Bill O'Brien liked the the setup. Could that have anything to do with Gerard Mayo now being the head coach where Bill O'Brien came back to work for Bill Belichick? Could. It would be only natural. Um, did Bill O'Brien know about the succession plan when he signed back here? What is his reaction to that? Um, I would put, I do think Bill O'Brien is somebody that um, would be on Bill Belichick's staff someplace else. Um, again, this is just what I'm hearing uh, and, and relating that to you guys. Um, but so I would put the chances of Bill O'Brien being staying with the Patriots as low, but I'm not taking it off the board. McDaniels, could he return? Very similar to O'Brien. I would put it at low. I'm not totally ruling it out. I could see him talking to Mayo at some point. Um, he, he does live locally. Um, the way that I understand it, uh, with his Raiders contract, if McDaniels, for example, you know, turns down head coaching or any coaching interviews or what have you with the offset language in his contract, the Raiders could come off after his money. So pretty much Josh McDaniels will listen to anybody at any point. And that includes Gerard Mayo and the Patriots. But again, I put that the odds at low. And I think that uh, McDaniels would have an opportunity with Bill Belichick in what capacity. I don't know. There's some different rumors about that, about like he might be more of a, um, you know, assistant head coach, sort of like Matt Patricia was when he came back here. That sort of thing, like liaison between personnel and coaching for any new Belichick regime, whether it be Atlanta or Dallas. Um, also, I, I do know that he ha he has there's some potential other opportunities with other teams that are somewhat interesting. So, again, for McDaniels, him being offensive coordinator to me uh, is low, but I wouldn't rule it out. If you were Mayo and you're choosing between those two guys, let's say they're both open to being here in New England. Who would you rather have, O'Brien or McDaniels? Well, I I like both those guys. I think McDaniels is slightly better than Bill O'Brien. However, depending on where I think I might be going with quarterback, and let's say they have a chance to get any of the top three quarterbacks who all in their different ways have athletic ability, it would be very tempting to me for me to go with Bill O'Brien after the work he did with Deshaun Watson, sort of retrofitting the Patriots offense, his Patriots offense for Deshaun Watson when he played the best ball of his career. So that would be very tempting to me. All right. So if you're telling us that both guys, it's more likely than not that O'Brien and McDaniels are not here in New England. We get to the open search. Mm -hmm. Uh would that be the best case for the Patriots? Could, could you make that argument? Get away from that old school scheme. Get away from that system. Start with something new. Start with something fresh. Is it actually best for Gerard Mayo to go outside the building? In many ways, yes, Nick. I think so. In some ways, no. And, you know, let me explain. Um, and people who listen to this pod, this is nothing new for them. I have always cautioned against the defensive head coach. Why? And I've seen, because you've seen it a million zillion times. Just look at Mike Vrabel in Tennessee. Defensive coordinator is is great. He has to hire an offensive coordinator. As soon as that offensive coordinator has success, he's going to get a head coaching job. Matt Lafleur in Tennessee with Vrabel. Arthur Smith in Tennessee with Mike Vrabel. Like all those guys left, and then look what was in the wake. Like it might work short term. You know, and we'll see with D'Amico Ryans. What's D'Amico Ryans going to look like with Bobby Slowick as offensive coordinator, who's getting, after one year, is going to be getting head coach interviews? Could he stay for another year, similar to Ben Johnson? Uh, 
Yes, but what happens in their wake? That's the big question. Like I, I it, to, to let's say Gerard Mayo goes out and gets a Kyle Shanahan disciple, somebody off of that that tree. I hope to God it's not Brian Greasy, who's the quarterbacks coach out there. Um, did not enjoy covering him as a player. Um, uh, you know, say say they get Brian Greasy as their offensive coordinator. Okay, he comes here and say he turns it all around in year one with Jaden Daniels at quarterback. And you don't think Brian Greasy is going to get head coaching, you know, interviews the next year. So in what happens once he leaves? So in many ways, yes, it's exciting. It should be the thing to do. And I'm sure it'll be heralded, but what's the end game? What's your plan? And this is something we've also talked about when I covered Nick Saban with the dolphins and he went through this, he lost, uh, Scott Linehan was his offensive coordinator in year one. He got the Minnesota Vikings head coaching job. Then he had to go to Mike Malarkey. And Nick Saban talked about, look, I learned this from Bill Belichick in Cleveland, and I think this is one of the underrated success stories of why the Patriots were as consistently good as they were, was Bill said, we are going to have a Patriots defensive playbook and a Patriots offensive playbook. It doesn't matter who the coordinator is. They're working off of this playbook, which is the Charlie Weiss scheme. And – so can Gerard do something like that? You know, I don't know. So, uh, again, uh, I, I would be all for it in many ways, but you got to have a long-term plan. What's your plan going to be once this guy leaves or doesn't work out or what have you? Are you you're just going to be getting new systems and new play callers every other year for your young quarterback? We saw it with Mac Jones. doesn't work. And, and part of that idea is, I think, building depth within your offensive staff, not only who's going to be your offensive coordinator, who is that guy bringing in? Who are other people you can go out and get? And Greg, I wanted your thoughts on this because I have a list of like eight to 10 guys that I think would make sense for the Patriots to reach out to. Some of those guys are part of staffs that are going to get blown up. So for example, if I am Gerard Mayo, am I sitting down and saying to myself, okay, Shane Waldron, time in New England, five years with McVeigh, From Seattle, Pete Carroll just got blown out, might be restarting that staff. Waldron did a really good job with Geno Smith last year. Not as good this year, but it is what it is. Meanwhile, there's also somebody out there like Clint Kubiak, who is the San Francisco passing game coordinator, who's worked with under the Shanahan Kubiak tree, obviously Gary's son. He had a great season with Kirk Cousins in 2021. Is that a possibility where Mayo goes, okay, you know what? Shane Waldron's looking for a job, tight ends coach, Clint Kubiak. We're going to promote you from passing game coordinator of San Francisco to offensive coordinator of the New England Patriots. That way, if Kubiak does get a gig, now you can easily transition to Waldron. Uh, I think it's possible you're going to run into complications with um, unless – uh, you know, teams can for lateral moves. I mean, you would have to find guys whose contracts are up or the team can deny lateral moves, which anything lower than a coordinator is deemed a lateral move. Um, right. You know, some of the some of the things that I would look for, like Shane Waldron is a great name to come in as offensive coordinator. He's exactly right. Then you need to find the next guy. Um, you know, could a, a Nick Cayley be yep. one of those guys who used to be here, has been in San Francisco I think for a year or two, Um, you also have the options of it looks like they're moving on from the McDaniels offense with the Vegas Raiders. Um, It looks like they'll keep most of the defensive staff, but we've already seen Carm Brasillo, the offensive line coach, get the Giants job. You know, could, um, you know, Mick Lombardi, who was uh, McDaniels offensive coordinator there, could he be an option? Any of those guys, Bo Hardigree could come open, who called plays in the interim, you know, that, sort of thing but I think you're absolutely right if they if they move in another direction and get a hot shot offensive coordinator it is uh, almost as important to make sure you develop the next guy and the next guy so you have continuity especially for that quarterback you got to find a quarterback's coach who can learn and grow with that quarterback yeah and when you look at the list of names that I came up with a lot of these guys are going to get head coaching interviews in the next 12 to 24 months. You know, the, the Kellen Moores of the world, the Kubiaks, yep. uh, Kaylee and Waldron are on my list. Mike LaFleur, who I think was stuck with Zach Wilson. We're not really sure what he is as an OC. Robert Sala took him to the Jets. 
out of San Francisco. He's currently the Rams offensive coordinator. Zach Robinson, a guy with a history here in New England, short but a history, works with quarterback yep. Shannon McVay Tree. Uh, he is the Rams passing game coordinator and quarterbacks coach Frank Smith down in Miami, who's coach under Mike McDaniel. He's coach under John Gruden. He's coach under Sean Payton. He's already getting head coaching looks. If you want to go to college, Cliff Kingsbury is a guy, senior offensive analyst mm-hmm. at USC, quarterbacks coach. Kyler Murray went to two Pro Bowls with Kingsbury as his coach. So you are going to run into that. One name I didn't mention, Greg. That's interesting, and I think Patriots fans would love it just because of the name. Eric Bieniemy, Ron Rivera, done in Washington. A whole new guard coming into Washington. Uh, Bieniemy. I would not be concerned about the enemy being a flight risk because he's had roughly 725 head coach interviews and yep. he can't land a gig. So Eric B is a guy who developed, helped develop Patrick Mahomes has a long history. We know it could Mayo maybe place a call to Eric B and say, Hey, Eric, you're done in Washington. Want to come up here in new England and work with a top three pick. I think that's a, I think that's a great name and he would be very high on my list and um you know as long as you do the other stuff and yeah it doesn't look like he's going to get a head coaching job you think at some point he might uh but you know you got to keep that pipeline strong how does the enemy work with others how does he do as far as heading up a coaching staff but absolutely that would be a name that would be um a feather in mayo's cap and go a long way to saying like hey you know looks like mayo knows what he's doing all right so that's all the on the field stuff for now greg let's talk about the front office your thoughts on the crafts deciding to keep Matt Groh and Elliot Wolf in top positions in that front office for now to run free agency and the draft. Um, similar to the Mayo hire. I just don't understand why you wouldn't. Okay. Say it's going to be, well, first of all, who's going to be in, in, we have them tomorrow, big press conference tomorrow at noon. Who's making decisions. Who's the primary football executive? Who's saying this is the direction that we're going? These are the type of linebackers we're looking for. This, it, you know, is it going to be Mayo um, when it comes to the number three overall pick? Who's the decider when it comes to are we trading down? Are we taking a quarterback? Are we taking Marvin Harrison Jr.? Like who is who who is doing that now? Look. Um, from people that I've talked to in the building, I mean, I. I don't think people are, at least some people, and I'm not saying this is everybody, but a lot of people aren't crazy about macro. They don't think he was ready for that role. Uh, Elliot Wolf has wide respect around the league in that building. Uh, Packers, Browns, he has unbelievable resources and contacts around the league. Um, he's been ready for that top job for a very long time. Um, I'm, I'm hoping that he would sort of be the top dog. But I, I don't know if that's going to be the case. Um, Patrick Stewart, obviously, uh, was VP in, in Carolina, uh, has also been in Philly, has been here. So he has great experience. I just don't understand similar to um, similar to the coaching position. Why not use this opportunity to talk to people? Maybe Gerard with Gerard there, maybe Gerard talks to somebody. And he's like, you know what? That's my guy. That's the guy I want to work with. That's the guy he sees. We see things very similarly. Like, this is the guy I want to work with. Like, let's lock him up. What's the harm in talking? You know, it's, it's, I'm not saying they're skirting the, the Rooney rule on purpose, but they got around it with the NFL coaching search. Now they're going to go around it with the GM search by not naming a GM. It's just, I don't, I don't think it's wise business. I mean, why, what's the harm in talking to a bunch of people? And, and seeing what might shake out. And who knows what you might glean about what, what other teams might be doing in the draft, X, Y, and Z, how things, how, how other front offices are evaluating players. I just don't see the harm. And again, it's another instance where the Patriots are limiting themselves. There is, and maybe I'm splitting hairs, but I do think there's a difference between the head coach search and front office personnel search. I'm not going to say GM because reportedly they're not going to name a, a GM or put a title on them. Because there are reports, multiple reports from credible people saying that Gerard Mayo has made calls. He has reached out to external candidates. He has had conversations with people. I'm just throwing it out there. I have to imagine Trey Brown is one of those guys in Cincinnati who has a link with Mayo. So 
there have been you know, reports hang that on, Nick, but he can't. Nick, I just want to say he can't do that. He can't just reach out to people around the league, people who are under contract. Like if he wants to talk to people, he has to put in a request. I'm just saying I just wanted to put that out there. Okay. Well, I, Again, I, I, I'm just going off of, again, multiple credible people have been have been saying that Mayo has been doing a lot of work with external candidates and he's been reaching out and all of that. I don't know at what levels. I don't know if he's doing some trickeration here. I don't know. But but at least there has been reports that Mayo is looking outside the building to address the front office. So at least there's that. As far as Wolf and, you know, Grow staying, I would I, I would not feel comfortable with Grow just because from what I have read and people in the know say he is through and through a Belichick loyalist. He's through and through a Belichick guy. He's learned everything from Belichick. He does everything Belichickian. Uh, he doesn't push back on Belichick. All of those kinds of things have been written and said about Macro. So I'm a little less enthused about him. But honestly, I don't have an issue with Elliot Wolf running this thing. If if that's what's happening, I don't have much of an issue because you just mentioned he's respected. He is credible. He's not from New England. He didn't come up through Belichick. Uh, so he's somebody who I think makes sense. And Greg, let me ask you this. I know people are upset at not going to the outside, but I think there are a couple of logical, reasonable counters to that. Number one, when you named Gerard Mayo, the head coach, before you named a GM or you went on a personnel search, you had to find a guy that's going to work with Mayo. That That's how it's going to work. And so, mm-hmm. you know, that Elliot Wolf has been in the building and Mayo has been in the building so would it not make sense to say, especially right now with Mayo jumping in and replacing Belichick, let's just keep somebody in there that he is comfortable with and that we think is actually pretty talented in Elliot Wolf. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, yeah, that's certainly possible. I see the benefits of that. And again, it's similar to the coaching search, you know, would be my point is maybe Gerard Mayo is your guy, but why not go talk to other people to reinforce at least to be like, all right, this is the best guy for the job. Like we talked to everybody else. We still think Gerard's the best. Why not do the same thing with GM where, or director of director of player personnel, where let's talk to a bunch of people, but Elliot Wolf is still the best. I mean, again, I just don't see the harm. Oh, I don't disagree with you. I I think the process should be talk to people and, and gather information. We've heard that the analytics department is well behind in New England. We've heard the staff is small, all of those things. Maybe they have new innovative ideas that could help you, no pun intended, craft the next front office for the next 10 years. It's just I don't think it's a – I think people look at this and go and – I, and I knew this was going to happen. They're just going to, they're keeping everybody. He's a Belichick guy. He's a Belichick guy. He's a Belichick guy. And what I would say is look at the background specifically, Wolf and Stewart and those guys. And I don't think it's a terrible idea to keep these guys in the building if they're talented and if they're good and they have that relationship with Mayo. Mayo has to have that trust. He's a new head coach. He's replacing Belichick. The last thing he has to have in the back of his mind is, is, is my front office guy, is my GM going to screw me here? They have to have the same vision. They've got to look at the mm-hmm. roster and say, this is what we want. So I don't think it's, I don't think it's terrible. And I, I also think people are kind of jumping to the next conclusion here about, well, they're just going to stay with this. There's still plenty of time before free agency. Yes, you want to make a move early. But they could still supplement Elliot Wolf and Matt Groh. Wait until Belichick gets a job. Belichick might pluck Matt Grow, and then you bring in somebody else. Like it, it's still it's still a possibility that you add extra people to this front office once the draft is over. Correct? Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. I just it's obviously the crafts have been thinking about this for some time, and the succession plan. Um, I just would think that their vision encapsulated more than just. Gerard Mayo replacing Bill Belichick as far as moving the team forward. And, you know, maybe it will. We'll have to see. I'm going to ask you this because this has been part of the thought process, too. I was thinking this, and I've heard Phil Perry mention it, too. Is it just, all right, guys, there's too much going on. Like, we're replacing the greatest coach of all time with a brand new head coach. That's going to bring a lot of change. 
And if if we overturned this front office, now we're talking about so much change from the coaching staff to the front office during this big off season, that might be too much chaos. And and as much as it looks like as it's uninspired or it's boring, maybe the best thing to do is get Mayo in. He's the guy. He gets his staff. And then we rely on the guys that have been doing the work for the last year that we think could be talented without Belichick overruling them on everything. And, and we're going to run with this because if we just flip the whole organization around, that might be too much too quick and destroy everything worse than anybody else is thinking. Uh, I would say that's a very team friendly view on things. Um, I would say that that, uh, Look, it, I'm not going to disregard it, but I would just say that there are normally w- the way things go when you make a regime change in the NFL. Um, yes, most of the personnel department stays intact through the draft. That's where their contracts run through. You bring in a new GM, whoever, vice president of player personnel to head the department. They work off of largely of what they're working with. They evaluate somebody else from the outside without any connections, they evaluate the scouting staff, um, the front office to see who's doing a good job, who they want to keep. They might bring in another key lieutenant, but they're working off the, the work that the front office has already done, plus what they're already bringing from their former, uh, their former organization, which – you know, you could glean, they might have better information on this quarterback or better contacts on that quarterback. So um, I understand that sentiment. I, I don't think that it's uh, totally outlandish or anything like that. I just think it's a little like, it's a little pie in the sky, a little, uh, uh, what's the name of the some fictional town where, uh, it was a little like happy days thing to me that that's that's not the way the real world works, in my opinion. Fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, let's get to Jonathan Kraft's role in all of this, because there's been conflicting reports. Uh, you have had one <laughs> side of this. Uh, Tom Curran and others have had another side of this. How much is Kraft going to get involved? Does he want to be involved? I have heard from Tom Curran that No. Unequivocally, Jonathan Kraft doesn't want to be involved with this. Robert doesn't want to be involved with this. They learned their lesson during the Bill Parcells time. They are not calling the shots. I've read differently from you, Greg. You've spoken to some sources that say oh, Kraft, Jonathan Kraft might be the driving force behind personnel. What do you think's going on right now? I, it does not surprise me in the least that uh, the crafts are putting out there about how they absolutely will not be involved. Um, I'm sure they would say that they didn't meddle in the last years of Bill Belichick, which is absolutely false. So I don't really believe what the crafts say. I'm not really going to believe what they say on Wednesday when they say like, Oh no, it's not us. Well, somebody has got to be the adult in the room and Gerard Mayo doesn't have the experience to do it. Um, so you, if you're going to, Fine. If you want to be out of this, if you don't want to be brought into this and they will be and people who know them and been around that building think there's no chance that that Jonathan Kraft is sitting all this out, that he's just some. Oh, no, we're going to hear. I have so many other businesses under the Kraft group to look at. Nobody believes that, you know, that I talk to. Nobody believes that's that's in the building. Believe that's to be the case. Now, I'm not saying you, that he's going to be Stephen Jones, but he's going to have a role. And if you don't want to have a role, if you want to make it clear, you don't have a role, you know what you do? You name a general manager that, (laughs) you know, either reports to you or what have you, or reports to the head coach, like whatever, if you want to be taken out of this, there's a simple way to do it. And all the things that you keep doing, not interviewing for the head coach, not naming a general manager. You know what that tells everybody around the league? Ownership's going to be involved. Ownership's running the show. So look, there's a there's an easy way out of this. If they want to, you know, stop being thin skinned and listening to reports and this and answering back and this and that, set it up that way. Go ahead. It's not hard to do. You hit the nail on the head. Tomorrow is a very important press conference at noon. And tomorrow. These, to me, are the, are the questions that need to be answered by the crafts, and they need to be answered clearly. 
I don't want word salad. Okay. Mm -hmm. I want clear answers. Number one, who is the number one? I agree with you, Greg. As much as we look at Elliot Wolf and how it, it could work out and Gerard Mayo and they have the relationship, everything I've said, I agree with you. A process should have happened, right? Go through a process and talk to people. Who's the number one in that building? Because I also agree with you on that. It needs to be clear. Who's taking responsibility and accountability for every single decision made this offseason? You have tens of millions of dollars to spend in free agency. You have the best draft pick you've had since 1993 when you drafted Drew Bledsoe. Who is making the call at the end of the day? Are we are we doing yay or nay inside the front office? Are we are we passing around straws in the front office and whoever draws the short straw makes the decision? Like what the hell's going on? Who is the number one? Who's making the call? So when a call is made, who can the fans look at and say they screwed that up? Who can the media ask after the draft is over? Why did you pick this guy? Why did you move down? Mm -hmm. Why did you move up? Secondly, Greg, and hopefully you, you ask some of these questions, what's the structure? Because if they don't want to answer who's in control, what's the structure? Who? Give me a tier system here. If you want to tell me Jonathan has nothing to do with this, then prove it. Tell me who is running the show. Tell me from top to bottom. Is it Elliot Wolf? Is it Matt Groh? Are you going to try to give us this collaborative crap? What is it? And third and finally, what's the process? What is the process? Mm -hmm. How are you deciding who to sign and who to draft, Greg? Yeah, I, I know we're going to hear a bunch of like, it's going to be like, uh, who is the GM the Red Sox just got? You know, the synergy. and oh, Greg Breslin. Uh, yeah, Breslin. There's going to be all these sort of like Harvard buzzwords and stuff like that. And you're going to hear all about, oh, collaboration. And we're not going to make a decision unless we have a consensus. And we're not. Gonna, here's the bottom line. And I got to. I got to make sure I get the wording right with the league to understand this. But from what I understand, each NFL team has to put down who the primary football executive is for the football team. They have to name a primary football executive and they have to name a secondary football executive. This comes with how, you know, some teams can say, well, like he he's a GM, but he doesn't really have personnel power and like all that stuff in terms of. So they have to do that at some point. I'm not sure when. Who is the primary football executive for the New England Patriots going forward? I think it's a huge question mark. Is it Gerard Mayo? Is it Matt Groh? Is it Elliot Wolf? Or is it Jonathan Kraft? Like, who, who is it? I don't know. Do you have any idea, Nick? Who do you think the front runner is to be the primary football executive? Well, I wanted to ask you this, and I know you got a couple minutes left here because you got to run for Felger and Mass. But I, I did want to ask you this. I, I keep reading Gerard Mayo's name. And seemingly, mm -hmm. Gerard Mayo is going to have a significant amount of power here. And so if that's the case, my first question is, and we'll do this rapid fire style. My first question, Greg, is that a good idea to give this guy all the power or a lot of the power when he's replacing Bill Belichick, which is a pretty significant job within itself? No. If Bill Belichick didn't have it until after the third Super Bowl, like Robert Kraft said the other day, there's no way in hell Gerard Mayo should have uh, have total control. If Gerard Mayo is going to have a significant amount of say, and look, he's gonna he's the head coach, right? At a certain point, you do have to ask the guy what kind of team he wants to field. We all know that. Yep. Well, we're talking about ultimate power, full autonomy. If he's going to have significant power then why would you just not talk to Mike Vrabel? Because my, my mm -hmm. whole thing about Vrabel was, well, Vrabel reportedly might want more power, and that was part of the issue in Tennessee. Well, if you're going to give Gerard Mayo all of this power in the first place, then why wasn't Vrabel more of a consideration? I completely agree with you. All right, let's close this up. Bill Belichick interviewing in Atlanta. Where do you think he goes? I think Atlanta's in his back pocket. He's waiting to see on Dallas and Philly. Ooh, interesting. We'll end on this note. If I told you 18 months ago that next weekend we would have Baker Mayfield, Brock Purdy, Jared Goff, C.J. Stroud, and Jordan Love two wins away from starting a Super Bowl, what would you say? Holy crap. <laughs> That's a really good point. That's what I would say. I would be like... 
Cattles is going to the dispensary in town too much. That's what I would have said. <laughs> Drug test the man. He's Greg. Yeah. Um, Gerard Mayo's press conference tomorrow with the Crafts. I'm sure we'll cover that. Well, who knows what else is going to break? It's bananas right now. Hopefully you enjoyed this pod. We're back later in the week. Until then, oh, no, I've got to say this. Episodes brought to you by FanDuel. Exclusive wagering partner of the CLNS Media Network. New customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets. Guarantee when you place a $5 bet. Now we leave. Goodbye. Goodbye.